Hi, Brooke. How you doing? Are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me, Brooke? I sure am. Sorry that took okay, so long. Cool. Not a problem. Just wanted to make sure that you are good on your side. My name is Dustin. I'm with, uh, I guess I can turn my video. I'm with Bowling Green State University. I'll be the moderator for the uh, session. Have you done one of these before or no? I haven't. I have several okay. in the coming weeks, but this is my first one. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So it's um, pretty straightforward. Let me share you this, share with you the screen that they have um, set up. And then that way you can kind of see what, what to expect. <clears throat> um, cool. You should be able to hopefully be able to see this. So this is, I will be sharing this screen at the start and then I'll turn it over to you. I'll go away. I'll turn off my mic and my video and then it'll be all you. So this particular information will be out there for the students. So for them, they can ask questions, but they're obviously not uh, able to talk to you or, or um, you can't see them. You'll get a listing of all the questions as well as the people who attend about a week after the event. Um, so sometime next week. So like I said, the students, their cameras and microphones are off and then they'll have access to the recording at oacac.org. So if there happens to be no one who shows up, um, just do your presentation as if there's people there because it'll be recorded and then they'll be able to, to view it later. So I had one last week where that happened where just go through it as if you're, you're talking to students. Um, at 45 minutes past, I will come on with this slide. So if you're not done at 45 minutes past, I will start sharing this screen and I'll let you finish up for like a minute or so. And then we got to get off because someone will need to get on at five, at 4.50 for them to be able to do their piece. So this will at 40, at 4.45, this is what you'll see. And then that'll be like a hard stop for you there. Um, the, if you need, are you going to do a screen share or video or anything like that, a PowerPoint, or are you just going to um, talk? Yes, I can use PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you want to try sharing your screen, you're welcome to take over. If you share your screen, it'll stop sharing my screen here. And then as it says here, if you're doing video, make sure you turn on the share computer sound. So that way, whatever's playing on your end, they're going to be able to hear on their end as well as in the recording as well. So you're, if you, if you take over the, sh if you want to share now, you're going to take over and mine will stop sharing. And then the same thing will happen at 45 minutes after. If you're still presenting at 45 minutes after, I'll start sharing and it'll drop off whatever you've got on your end. Okay. And you're, I don't know where your mic is at, but your volume is kind of low. It might be better to, um, I don't know if there's a way to up your mic volume or if you just might want to speak a little bit louder. Um, Can you hear me better now? A little bit better. Um, are you using just like the computer's mic or do you have an external mic by chance? No, I'm just using my computer mic. Okay. So I would just say like talk, uh, talk as loud as you can. Um, and it, I'll see if maybe my volume is down. Let me turn up my volume. Let me turn it up to like 60. Okay, go ahead and try talking now. Hi, my name is Brooke Hoosier and I'm from Ball State University. Okay, it might have been on my side then because that's a lot louder. <laughs> um, and I've got, I've got wireless <laughs> headphones in, so that might be the issue as well. So it, it was probably just my on my side here. Okay. And cool. Yep, I can see that. That looks good. And do you have sound or no sound or videos or anything like that? No, I don't have any video. Cool. Okay, perfect. So then I'm going to put up the, um, the slide that we have. I will share my screen. And then when you're ready, you can take over by sharing your screen. And then, like I said, at um, okay. 45 minutes after, then I will come back on with another screen. But once, uh, once we're all done, or once we are at the very end of it, when I hit end, we're just gone at that point. So won't be anything anything good for that. Like I said, you'll get a listing about a um, few minutes after. Okay. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and stop video and, and wait for everyone to get in.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to the OACAC Virtual College Fair presentation by Ball State. Uh, just a few quick reminders before we get started. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button to type out your question, and the presenter will be able to respond to your questions there. If all the questions are not able to be answered during the presentation, they will get a listing of all the questions and be able to respond to you. They won't get that listing until about a week later, so keep that in mind with response times. Your camera and microphone are both off. So again, if you need to communicate with the presenter, please make sure to answer or ask those questions in the Q&A section. Uh, the recording of this particular webinar will be available in about one week at oacac.org, the same spot that you use to register for today's presentation. And if you would like to sign up for additional presentations, you can sign up at the same website, oacac.org. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to the presenter. Hi everyone, my name is Brooke Hoosier and I'm the Associate Director of Admissions and I'm really glad that you're here today learning about Ball State University. I commend you on starting your college search or continuing on with your college search even during really abnormal circumstances. So I'm glad you're here. Um, again, my name is Brooke Hoosier and I am a Ball State grad. I graduated a few years ago now with a degree in social studies secondary ed. So I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and then I went to grad school elsewhere, but my experience is at Ball State in working with other students in my academics and my student life is really what made me passionate about my school and made me want to continue working in admissions. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and again, I'm glad that you're here. So we can really just jump on in and get started. Um, first of all, I am not the Ohio rep. We have a gentleman named Ethan Hines, who is the Ohio representative. So if you have questions specific about what's it like as an Ohio student to come maybe to Ball State, um, Ethan would be a great resource for you. His email and phone number is listed right there. Um, feel free to reach out to him. He'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm just taking the first one for him. And um, we're gonna do another one of these in a few weeks, um, just based off of some scheduling conflicts. But I'm excited to talk to you too. And realistically, any one of us in admissions is always happy to help any prospective student. So just to delve right in, if you don't know a ton about Ball State, here's a couple of basic facts for you. Um, we have, let's see here, 120 undergraduate majors and seven different academic colleges. So we have programs that are nationally ranked and recognized in areas like architecture, um, telecommunications, performing and fine arts, education, business, and some sciences as well. So there's a lot of different things to study. And then even if you have a major in mind, I would really encourage you to check out our full list of majors because there can be some things that you can study at Ball State that you may not have even heard of um, or be familiar with. So we have some unique majors, things like um, hearing impaired, deaf education, glass art blowing, residential property management, aquatics and fisheries, some really unique things that you can study that I wouldn't even known were majors maybe when I was in high school. So check out the full list. We also have 130 minors. A minor is a great way to really tailor what it is you're studying to what it is you ultimately wanna do. For example, um, one of my students, he's a tour guide, he's majoring in that aquatics and fisheries uh, major that I just mentioned. Um, and so he knows he wants to work with marine wildlife in the future, but he knows he needs to be able to scuba dive. That's a skill set that he'll need. So his minor is scuba diving. Alternatively, one of our admissions interns, she loves theater, um, but she didn't really want to study it as her full major. So her major is communications, but her minor is theater. That's an outlet for her to kind of escape her major sometimes, and it's still something she enjoys doing. Um, so that's another way of looking at a minor too. Um, beyond on majors and minors, we have about 30 degrees that are considered a degree in three programs, which means they can be done at an accelerated rate. So it's the same amount of courses, same amount of credit hours required, but you are taking summer school um, and maybe a, a heavier course load during the academic year that allows you to graduate in three years. That can be really helpful when you're looking at student debt um, or if you're looking at going on to grad school, finishing that degree a little bit faster. So you may want to check out if one of your majors in mind can be a degree in three program. If you're undecided, 
take a deep breath. It is okay. It's really hard to know what it is you want to do and study um, when you're 17 or 18 years old. So um, we have a route for students called exploratory studies that is for our undecided students. Our exploratory study students are working with both their academic advisor, so that person that's helping them select their classes, and they're also working with their career center advisor. That person is helping them identify what are your strengths, um, what are some things that you just enjoy doing, um, and really helping you narrow down our 120 majors to something that's a good fit for you. Um, so there's a pathway for you too if you don't know what it is you want to study. Ultimately, um, we have faculty that have really high expectations of our students, and what that leads to is a 94% 94, 94 placement rate, meaning that within six months of graduating, 94% of our students are either enrolled in a full-time position or they're enrolled in a graduate school program. Um, so we know our students go on to be very successful in their chosen careers. Again, check out our website for more information about our majors and minors or what it means to be an undecided student. So something that we think makes Ball State really unique, if you haven't heard of this, it's our immersive learning opportunities. An immersive learning opportunity is like a clinical or an internship or a practicum, those types of work experience and um, things that all college students should get the opportunity to do, our students do those too, but additionally, they have these immersive learning projects. So an immersive learning project is completed during the academic year, so you're earning credit. It's not something you're spending your whole summer devoted to doing, um, but you're applying what you've learned in your classes to the real world. You're working with fellow students that may be in your major, but may not be, and you're working under a faculty mentor to help guide you, um, but ultimately, it's a student-led experience. So it's something that you can put on your resume, um, and when you're applying for those jobs and the employer says, we need one to two years of professional experience, that's really hard to get when you're pursuing a college degree, um, but this is one way that you can. You're building your immersive learning uh, kind of portfolio, I suppose. Anyways, we've been doing these for about 12 years and we have thousands of examples from every single major. Um, so regardless which major it is that you end up selecting, you can participate in an immersive learning project. Um, one of my favorite examples is what we call BSU at the Games. So every time an Olympics is being hosted, our telecommunication students, journalism students, um, our film and TV students, so again, different majors, um, actually come together to go to the Olympics. And this past Olympics in South Korea was the first time that Ball State students were actually given official media badges. So they were actually able to film the games themselves and the content that was shown from our news affiliate stations in Chicago and in Indianapolis was actually filmed by Ball State students. They got to do some athlete interviews, just some cultural pieces too, but that was an awesome way for our students to get hands-on experience um, and still be able to do other internships and that type of thing outside of the academic year. There are so many examples of this. Another recent one that I thought was really cool um, was was done for a non-for-profit organization in downtown Muncie. It's a center for performing arts. They do things like um, kind of free or reduced price um, music lessons, dance lessons. That can be um, really hard for low-income families to give their kids that opportunity to participate in such activities. Anyways, um, their bathrooms were non-compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act, so they weren't wheelchair accessible, and that was a huge issue. So they reached out to Ball State for help, and it, ultimately it was our architecture and interior design students that designed new bathrooms, and then those bathrooms were implemented. So it was critical that they did a good job because ultimately those are the facilities now for that organization. Um, so again, that's two examples out of thousands. If you check out the Immersive Learning website, you would be able to read through some recent examples. Um, if you have a major in mind, you could reach out to your academic department and say, hey, what are your students doing? What are some recent examples that they've done to give you a better idea of what you might do in your time at Ball State? 
So a little bit about our faculty. Um, we're really proud that 92% of our classes are taught by our PhD faculty. So they are ultimately experts in their field. It's really unlikely for you to have a class that's taught by a graduate student. Um, again, you'll get to know your faculty really well here. Our students faculty ratio is 14 to one and our average class size is 21. So I encourage you to take a moment and just reflect on your own high school experience. What are your classes like in high school? You may find that your Ball State classes are actually uh, very similar in size to what you're already experiencing, or they could even be smaller. I know I came as an out-of-state student too. Um, I came from Florida at a high school of a little over 4,000 people. And when I got to Ball State, it was really shocking that my classes in my major were actually smaller than what I had, ex than what I had experienced in high school. Um, so think about that. Think about what size of class maybe sounds ideal to you. Um, where do you think you're going to be successful at? Is it in a smaller setting? Um, or do you think lecture halls are something that would really benefit you? Um, so think about that when you're comparing colleges and, and looking at your search. Your faculty member is always going to be your best resource. They are there to help you. Uh, but beyond that, you also have a lot of other resources too. I think the biggest difference between high school and college, it's not that it's so much more difficult or the content is incredibly harder. It's really, I think, learning about self-advocacy and learning to speak up and ask for help and know how to seek out those resources that are available to you um, because it has changed uh, from high school to college and that you are more independent and there's maybe no such thing as progress reports or no one's letting you know um, your parents know that maybe you're slacking a little bit in school um, so you really have to kind of take ownership of your degree and your college education and seek out resources if you need help. So some of those resources that we do have include academic advising. We do one-on-one -on -one academic advising here. There's no such thing as group advising. So the summer after you graduate from high school, you would have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with your academic advisor to discuss your classes for fall, but to get you on that four-year plan right from the start. Um, so you would know your advisor really, really well. Um, our students are encouraged to meet with their advisor a minimum of two times a semester. We also have a great career center. The career center, the resources that they offer kind of depends on where you're at in your college career. So maybe your freshman year, it's about helping you identify a major. And then later on, it's helping you write your first resume and cover letter. And then finally helping with internship and job placement. They also have what we call the cardinal closet. Um, so if you know, buying a professional wardrobe is a tough thing to do and you're on a budget, um, you could seek out the Cardinal Closet and get a free wardrobe um, for your use and for, your, for you to keep when you're, so that way you can be confident, you know, when you're going to interviews and that type of thing. Um, they also do mock interviews, which are so painful because you'll think you nailed it and they'll video videotape you and maybe play it back and you've said like, 30 times within your first 10 minutes, but those types of resources are really helpful. They, let's see here, another resource that we have is our counseling center. Counseling is absolutely free to students. Uh, we do both one-on-one -on -one advising, or excuse me, counseling, as well as group counseling. So depending on if it's more helpful to be around peers, or maybe if you're looking for a um, more private conversation based upon your needs, that's what the counseling center will work with. Um, so if ever students are feeling homesick or whatever issues may arise, um, definitely seeking out the counseling center is critical. We also have learning center, uh, our learning center. So our learning center offers free tutoring in all 100 and 200 level classes, as well as some of our upper level courses too. So there's no shame in seeking out a tutor. Sometimes it's awesome just to have a tutor if you have an A or B and they kind of reinforce I do know what I think I know. Um, and so it's just good to have almost like a study partner. Um, but the learning center is also free. They also have um, a writing center. So you can have your papers reviewed and edited before you're actually turning them into a grade. Um, they also have a math lab. If you struggle with math, somebody that really excels in math could help you. Um, so there's so much help to be had. It's just a matter of simply asking for it. 
Um, so definitely being knowledgeable about the resources that we have on campus is critical to having a successful future. So of course, um, you're gonna have a ton of fun in college. Our, that's our hope anyways. You're coming for one reason and that's to get that college degree. But we want you to have so much fun while you're here too. So there are a lot of different ways to get involved and I can almost promise uh, that anything you're involved in high school, you can probably continue on with while you're in college too. We have over 400 student organizations and they might be affiliated with your major. So maybe it's a professional academic society. Maybe it's just a kind of like a faith-based group, a political affiliated group or a hobby and interest related group. Um, there's truly something for everyone with over 400 groups. So we have things like from starting with A with the accounting club all the way down to the zombie apocalypse preparation club. So there's a big spectrum there and I would hope that you could join one or two organizations and really find your group of people. Um, beyond just regular student organizations, we do have Greek life on campus. There are 30 sororities and fraternities total. I will say that only about 14% of the Ball State population joins a sorority or fraternity. So if that's not of interest to you, don't worry. There's so many more uh, outlets for you to join um, and there's no really peer pressure on a campus to join Greek life. That being said, it certainly is an option if you'd like to get involved. There's a ton of fun traditions that we have on campus. Um, homecoming bed race is always one of our favorite, our students' favorites, but it is really exactly what it sounds like, uh, where you're on a team of students, um, where you are racing down the main kind of drag through campus, and um, you're on a bed that has wheels, and you're just <laughs> you're trying to beat the other team. Air jam is a really popular also activity where students are lip syncing. And then finally, every spring to celebrate the end of the school year and making it through the spring semester, we host a huge carnival on our campus with really fun rides, great food, all that you can kind of imagine. Um, beyond student organizations and activities, we of course encourage our students to get involved in the Muncie community. So a lot of students will participate in what we call student voluntary services, where they are paired with a volunteer um, event or organization, one way to get involved and improve our community. And then we also have plenty of ways to get immersed in cultural activities on campus. So we have two theaters as well as a few of our other performance halls that are more music based. But anyways, to get into any event, um, tickets are either free or they're greatly reduced for students. So this is kind of at this point an older example, but when I was a student, I went and saw um, Macklemore <laughs> Who was really popular at the time and um, Walk the Moon that was a popular band so and the tickets were um, under ten dollars for both and um, so it's a great way to kind of get a little bit of culture um, there's also um, Broadway shows that will come through campus as well as really phenomenal speakers um, so there's always something to do if you're looking for that and then finally we do have sports on our campus we compete in the MAC conference. So for my Ohio residents against schools like, um, let's see here, Miami of Ohio, um, Toledo Zips, those types of schools, those are our biggest competitors. Um, but we compete at the division one level with 19 teams total. And to get into any home event, it's totally free. You just show your student ID. Uh, our students love your kind of traditional sports like basketball and baseball and football. Um, for me personally, I've always had a lot of fun at the volleyball games. Our men's volleyball team was nationally ranked and the last home game I went to against this past year was against Harvard and Ball State totally killed them and it felt so good by association. So go to those types of games. It's a ton of fun. Um, you can also participate in club sports where you're traveling to other universities and playing their club teams or maybe you're doing something like an intramural sport where it's really just a group of maybe you and your friends or people that live on your floor and just kind 
and playing for fun. It's really as competitive as you want to make it. Um, I did Battleship, if you remember that game from childhood. Um, but in this version, you're actually in a canoe in our swimming pool, and you're just trying to sink somebody else's canoe before they can sink yours. It's pretty simple. Um, but those are the fun kind of cheap things that students do to get involved on our campus and really make Ball State feel like home um, by meeting people and getting out um, on campus. So if you're not familiar with Muncie, um, a little bit just kind of to give you some context about Muncie, um, by no means are we a booming metropolis. We're not in Manhattan, um, but it's also not particularly tiny either. We've got a population of about 70,000 uh, residents, and that does not include our student population. Um, so Muncie has its own kind of unique, I'd say, vibe outside of just Ball State. So while Ball State is critical to the Muncie community and a big part of who Muncie is, um, there's so much to do kind of outside of just Ball State too, if that makes sense. We are pretty close to cities, um, so about an hour from Indianapolis and a little over two hours away from Cincinnati. Um, so if you're looking for a big community sometimes to maybe go to for the weekends, you're looking to do a road trip with friends, cities aren't that far away. Um, I think one of the big perks to Ball State is that um, we are a really affordable college town. So for our students that choose to live off campus after that freshman year, um, the rent that they pay is pretty affordable or, you know, living in a house with friends, um, it's definitely doable. Um, so that is definitely a perk um, when you're moving off campus. Um, but some of my favorite things to do in on kind of in the Muncie area include going to the downtown area, which is maybe a 10 minute bike ride from campus, or we have a bus system that's perpetually running every 15 minutes from campus to downtown Muncie. But there's great coffee shops, um, great, great restaurants, just an outdoor venue for concerts, um, lots of things to always be doing in downtown. Um, our students love Minatrista, which if you're looking for some nature um, off campus, Minatrista is just a short walk off campus, but they have a lot of hiking trails um, and just outdoor events and farmers markets, that type of thing, and really beautiful gardens. So I know our students love Minatrista. And we also have um, awesome bike paths near campus, as well as um, kayaking on the White River, which again, is just a few minutes from campus. So there's plenty to do um, and check out outside of just Ball State. Now we do require our freshmen to live on campus and after that it's actually up to you so that's kind of food for thought down the road um, as you are an upperclassman at whatever university you choose thinking about you know what are the perks to staying on campus to moving off and having a conversation um, with your family about what suits you best so there are perks to living on campus our students that stay on campus do have a higher gpa of students that move off and i think there's a couple of reasons for that uh, one, they're just closer to their classes, to study sessions, and to on-campus activities. Um, but also because we have something called living learning communities here. We offer 13 LLCs is what we call them. Um, but an LLC is a group of students that share a major um, or are within the same academic college and they live together. So the benefit to that is that you and your roommate have something in common at the very least but also it's really helpful academically. So let's say for instance, you're studying nursing and you live in the College of Health LLC, your roommate is likely to be, is going to be a nursing major. And then there's also likely going to be several other nursing majors on your floor. So maybe you're struggling with your organic chemistry homework one night, it's not that hard just to kind of walk down the hallway and find somebody that may be having that same exact assignment. And so that's where that natural advantage comes in. All of our residents, every single one of our residence halls are actually new or recently renovated. So the amenities that they offer are pretty cool. Every single residence hall has its own fitness lab, um, its own um, computer lab, so free printing. I never had to worry about bringing a printer, um, as well as kitchenettes and that type of thing. And then you'll also have amenities that are specific to your LLC. So for instance, if you're a music major, your LLC will have practice rooms, 
um, that maybe a different residence hall wouldn't. Um, but you can find more about housing on the website. I know I get a lot of questions about um, roommate searches and I don't blame you. It's pretty nerve wracking to think that you could live with somebody that you don't know really well. Um, there are a couple of ways to get a roommate. The first way is if you know somebody from your high school, um, you can request each other. But as a word of advice, we actually have more roommate conflicts with people that knew each other previously. So while it's daunting, it may actually work better to room with somebody that you don't know. When you're applying for housing, you'll have to answer a questionnaire um, and create a profile that links you to other students. So you could look through other students, connect with other students and find a roommate that way. And finally, the third way is by what we call going potluck, where the university picks for you based off of that student profile that you have um, created, um, helping you, trying to help you find a match that's suitable. Um, I can say I went potluck and it couldn't have worked out better. Um, my roommate and I were from different states and we certainly didn't know each other. She joined a sorority immediately, was really outgoing, got me out of the shell and introduced me to people I'd never probably would have met on my own. Whereas I became a teaching assistant for one of her classes. So I helped her academically and we studied together. So we really balanced each other out. Um, and then fast forward a few years and she was my maid of honor and I was hers. So I promise really good things happen. So if you've heard from your cousin's cousin that their roommate was a nightmare, certainly those things happen. Um, but for the most part, it can be a really positive experience. Of course, food is part of dining, or sorry, food is part of living on campus too. Um, we have a ton of different dining halls. Your ID gets you into any single one of them. You do not have to live to the, go to the one that's a, kind of connected to your residence hall. That's not a requirement. Um, they're well equipped to handle all diets, whether you're vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, it doesn't matter. Um, you can also work with our campus nutritionists to help you figure out what meals are a good option for you. And then we also have chains that work with your student ID too, whether that's Taco Bell, Jamba Juice, uh, Starbucks, lots of different options. Um, so you will not go hungry here, that I promise. Of course, as you're comparing colleges, one thing that you'll definitely need to consider is cost. So to give you a, a couple of statistics, um, four out of five students qualify for either need-based aid, so that's based off the FAFSA, if you've heard of that, or merit-based aid, which is based off of your academic profile that's submitted to us when you apply. So certainly help is pretty likely. Um, if you're looking at just the total cost of attendance as an out-of-state student, without any type of scholarships or without any type of aid, it's just under $38,000. So that's a pretty, that's a big number. Most people don't have $38,000 just in a savings account waiting for them. I mean, that's why that um, need-based aid and merit-based aid is so critical. Um, so for need-based aid, you need to submit your FAFSA if you're a senior starting October 1 of your senior year. And that tells us if you qualify for things like grants, um, which is the money you don't pay back, as well as loans. Um, so you have between October 1 and April 15th to file that FAFSA. It's based off of whomever you're dependent on. But I would really encourage you to fill out that FAFSA sooner rather than later so you can compare costs. You know, apples to apples, what does it cost to attend Ball State versus another school that you're accepted to? Um, we also offer merit based scholarships. Um, an out of state student can receive up to $16,000 to help make it um, roughly what an in state student would pay. And um, how we determine if you're eligible for a merit based scholarship, it's really just based off of the information that's submitted when you apply. So we're looking at your GPA, we're looking at your test scores if provided, um, and you'll know automatically in your acceptance packet what you've qualified for. One tool that I would love to shout out is our scholarship calculator. If you head to our website or if you even Google Ball State Scholarship Calculator, it'll come right up, but it allows you to self-report your GPA and test scores, and that way you can anticipate what you're going to be offered. Um, but that's a great tool. Um, beyond merit-based scholarships that you get when you're accepted, you can also qualify for scholarships from your academic department. Not all majors do give money to incoming freshmen, but some do. So again, head to our website at bsu.edu scholarships and find out what you could additionally apply for based off of your major.
And then finally, just as a word of advice, there are ways to cut down cut down on the cost of college. If you haven't already, I would really recommend that you connect with your guidance counselor and see if there's anything in your community that you can apply for. Um, and then I would encourage you to continue to look for scholarships as you progress through college. You may find that your major doesn't give money to incoming freshmen, unfortunately, but they do to upperclassmen. So maybe you qualify for a scholarship as a junior or senior. Um, so continue to look for scholarships while you're even in college. And then any other opportunity that you can while working on campus can cut down on the cost of college too, maybe. Something that I did, I was an RA, if you've heard of that, it's a residential assistant. It's kind of like a floor mom or floor dad role. It was definitely a tough job, but it was such a huge deal to my family because by doing that job, it waived my room and board fee. So that was over $10,000 that was just gone off of my bill. Um, so you could look at opportunities like that to help cut down on the cost of college too as you progress through. If you haven't applied already, um, the application is open now and we operate on a rolling admissions basis. So we are already looking at applications and releasing decisions. We just recommend that to be reviewed for all of our merit-based scholarships, it is ideal to apply by December 1st of your senior year. Um, and if you're looking to enroll in the fall, so fall 2021 in August, you really want to apply at the latest by March 1st. Now, there are a few things that we look at when reviewing applicants. First, we look at your curriculum. So we'd like to see four years of English and then three years of math, social studies, and science. If you are looking at the Honors College, the Honors College also requires a fourth year of math as well as some foreign language. Um, so we're looking at that curriculum. What type of classes have you taken? Have you challenged yourself potentially by taking an Honors class, a dual credit class, or a CCP class, or an AP class? Um, we're looking at the rigor of your curriculum. We're looking at recent grade trends. You know, how does that most recent junior year look? Are you on a positive trajectory since freshman year? Or maybe uh, was junior year not quite where you wanted it to be? Recent grades are critical in our decision making process. We're looking at your weighted GPA. If your high school doesn't weight your GPA automatically, we actually have a process of reweighting it to give you that benefit anyways. Um, but we're looking at that cumulative weighted GPA. And then something that is new to Ball State as of two years ago is that we are test optional. So if you think that your test scores, if you got to take them, are a great testament to what you're capable of, by all means submit them. However, if you think that your grades and the rigor of your classes is a better reflection of what you're capable of, don't feel compelled to send your test scores. You are still equally considered for both admission and scholarships. So we are test optional, um, and it's not detrimental to be test optional in our application process. So think about kind of what shows you off in your potential best. You do need to submit our online application. Um, we don't use the Common App. It's our own application portal you can find on our website. Um, so just apply online and then have your school transcript sent. That's not something a student can send to us. It is something that needs to come directly from your high school. And um, so they might choose to use something called parchment or naviance. Those are electronic portals, I should say, that they can have the transcript sent through. We're happy to have it sent that way or to have it mailed. It's just not something that you could email to us yourself. Finally, um, we don't require essays or letters of recommendation if you're applying for general admission. However, if you have those tech kind of statements and documents that you'd like to submit, by all means, you can, and that does help us, particularly if a student is kind of in the gray area. That being said, it's not required, but it can be helpful. And finally, the last step kind of in the process of applying is that, again, we really want you to apply for financial aid um, starting in a few days when you can submit your FAFSA. So um, that's coming really soon. Um, once we get your application and your test scores, if you want to submit those and your transcript, it takes us somewhere between four and six weeks to make our decision. So bear with us. I know it's probably really hard to apply and wait to hear back from schools, but we're doing our best um, to make a quick decision, but that it's the best decision for both you and us. Finally, if you are looking at any schools and fine and performing arts, 
arts, or sorry, any majors within fine and performing arts or within architecture or the Honors College, they do have an additional application um, that is within our regular application. So just don't be surprised when there is a second step. And to give you a few figures, our average student has about a 3.5 GPA, and then our average SAT was an 1160, and our average ACT was a 23. Again, that's simply the average. Certainly students are admitted with higher um, and scores and ranges, and then certainly our students are admitted with lower too. So it really is a big spectrum. If you haven't visited Ball State, I encourage you to check out campus um, virtually. Uh, we have so many different sessions. There's admissions presentations, there's student chats where you can just chat with a current student to really get that inside scoop on what daily life is like. Um, you also have, you could register for a one-on-one -on -one admissions appointment to meet with Ethan if you'd like, your Ohio representative, if you just have conversations that are specific to you and your needs. There's also a virtual campus tour where you can check out campus academic buildings, and see to the best of your ability while you're home, what campus looks like. We also have financial aid sessions. If you are really lost on what it means to apply for the FAFSA and you have questions, you wanna meet with a one-on-one -on -one financial aid representative, there are opportunities for that as well. And then finally, if you have a major in mind, all of our academic units are doing um, admissions appointments. So you can meet with faculty from your intended major. We're also about to release virtual housing tours um, where you can see your specific residence hall in your LLC. Um, but again, I just want to emphasize, I know this is odd this year, um, but there are so many ways to tour campus um, beyond just actually coming to campus and maybe doing self-guided tours or registering for a limited, we have very small but limited um, campus tours available too. So there are plenty of ways to check out Ball State if you haven't seen it yet. And just so you know, this is what it looks like on our website to schedule any one of those virtual opportunities that I named. You can head to our website and schedule one of those virtual sessions here, or you can schedule a tour um, as well for in-person. But again, those are really limited. Um, so um, its availability is, is kind of limited at this point. And again, that's when our high school sessions are being offered. Um, so really, we'd love to chat with you at any opportunity that we can. So I'll um, answer any questions that anyone has at this time. Um, let me head to the chat. Okay, so there are no currently open questions, which is okay. Um, but let's talk about a few questions that I typically do get um, just when working with prospective students. I know a lot of times I get asked, parking, is there parking available to students on campus? Absolutely, as a freshman, you can bring your car. Um, speaking from a personal experience as an out-of-state student, I didn't bring a car um, and still was able to navigate the Muncie area just fine for my first two years. And then after that, I did bring a car. But we have a bus system that runs to campus to from campus to the downtown area where our students are likely to hang out um, it'll go to target and the mall and walmart as well as just shopping areas um, and then also we'll take students to airports um, on breaks and that type of thing not that i think a lot of ohio residents will be going to the airport um, but if you don't have a car that's okay if you do Freshmen absolutely can bring a car. It is an additional expense. Um, and our freshmen actually park at the football stadium and take the bus to and from their car um, into the football stadium back to maybe their residence hall and that type of thing. It's perpetually running again every 15 minutes it does a loop. Um, so it's not like you're having to wait long to get to your car. I will say that most students if they bring a car aren't using it for daily use but just for the occasional weekend to maybe go back home or um, on the weekends or that type of thing, it's definitely not critical to have a car while you're just living on campus. Another question I get asked about is just the size of Ball State. So as you're comparing colleges, think about what size you think really suits you best. So we have um, just over 22,000 students. So we're considered a mid-sized university. Um, and our students refer to campus as the Goldilocks campus of Indiana. 
meaning we're not so large um, that our students get lost or feel like a number, but we're also not exceptionally tiny either. There's some plenty of resources to be had um, and great facilities that come with going to a bigger university, but still getting that small class size and that small school feel. Um, so that's definitely something to think about too as you're pursuing um, colleges is what size really works best for you. Other questions I get asked a lot of times this one is more comes from our kind of my parents that are sitting in on sessions, but it's about campus safety. Um, so there are a lot of measures our university takes to make sure to ensure that our students are safe. To go over a few, um, we do have a licensed police department on our campus and you see them, our police officers on campus all the time. They're very proactive, not reactive. They practice something called community policing where they get to know people, they're just always visible. Um, and so our residence halls are each assigned a couple of police officers. So those are the police officers you see most commonly in your residence halls. Um, they do something called lunch with a cop. So you can get to know, uh, it's a free lunch for a student, but get to sit down with the police officer and get to know our staff on campus. Um, in terms of just campus safety itself with actual like, um, physical amenities. We do have the blue lights that you see at a lot of campuses um, that are stationed all over campus. You can't be standing at any point on campus and not see a blue light, um, but those are connected to 911. So should you ever be in a situation, which of course I would hope not, but um, if you were, you could just press the emergency building, or excuse me, emergency button, and that would be connected to our police department immediately. Um, beyond that, our residence halls um, do have ID swipes so that only residents of that building can get into their residence hall beyond 11 p.m. Um, so after that, you have to check in with the night host, swipe your ID, ensure that it is you. Um, and, um, you know, I just always encourage students or I remember when my little sisters were going to college, we talked about in the same way that if you were leaving mom and dad's house, you would make sure the doors were locked when you were leaving. That same thing applies when you're in college too. So um, while campus is safe, absolutely, I always just encourage people to be smart um, and to lock their doors and that type of thing. Um, but campus is really safe um, and I would love for you to see it yourself um, to kind of experience that. Um, other questions I get asked, geez, I don't know. Um, a lot of times I get asked about test optional, what it means to be test optional and why we went test optional. Um, so to give you some context into that, um, we went test optional two years ago because we did an internal review and it showed us that students that were retained in their sophomore year and that graduated on time, it wasn't simply a reflection of their high school performance who had the best test scores. It was actually um, connected to who had rigorous classes and then did well in those classes. So who had high or solid GPAs. So we know and recognize that sometimes students have grit and they perform really well in the classroom, but they don't always excel on a, on a test and that's okay. So that's why we went test optional. Again, test optional applicants are just as likely to get a scholarship. Um, so there's no concerns there if that's something that you're worried about. Well, it doesn't look like there's any other kind of open questions at this time. So I'll wrap up, but again, thank you so much for meeting with me today or for checking out this recording online. We'd love to see you on campus. Apply, the application is open and I hope you're enjoying your senior year. Again, if we can help in any way, um, just let us know. Um, but with that, I'm done. At Ball State, we chirp, chirp, so chirp, chirp. Thank you. And for everyone who attended, just a quick reminder that there will be a quick survey after the session has ended. If you wouldn't mind providing those answers, we'd appreciate that. You can sign up for additional sessions at oacac.org and recording of this session will be available at the same website, oacac.org, within about a week. I hope everyone has a great evening and thanks for attending.